Send me. Uh, my name is Timon Schep. I work as an artist and as a technology critic and a privacy designer. Whichever hat I wear kind of depends on, on where I am. Um, but in the past couple of years, I've been working for the European Un Union in a project called Sherpa, which was about the future of AI and what issues the European Union should deal with around AI. And as an artist, I was allowed to reflect on that research. And that led, amongst other things, to the creation of this interactive documentary called HowNormalAmI.eu. And this is a website where, in five minutes, your face will be uh, scanned by your own webcam, and then uh, it will, a number of algorithms will look at your face and, and judge you. And I thought to, to try it. Who here has already done it? Not a lot of people. So I thought, if, if you trust it, I'm, I'm also a privacy designer. So this thing is 100% privacy friendly. It runs 100% locally on your own device. So if you trust me, go ahead for just a minute or two, try it, so you can kind of get a feel of what it is before we continue, because then uh, my, the rest of my talk will be a lot easier. So if you kind of just seen the website and like, ah, oh, right, okay, this, this is what it does. So I'll give you two minutes for that. Shall we um, slowly continue? Um, you can try it at home all you want, and, uh, but at least you got a little bit of the vibe of what it is. So it judges your face on your beauty and your age and all kinds of things. Uh, so you'll have seen something like this, um, and when, this is what you see when you complete it. So you'll, you'll, this, um, this project uses a number of uh, algorithms or AI that I found online that were ready-made, that I just scraped from the internet. Um, so beauty, that was a, a Chinese algorithm, for example, age and gender, uh, emotion, etc. But there was one that I really wanted to add to this project that I could not find small enough in, in my searches, and that was one to uh, uh, analyze your body mass index, or BMI, based on your face. 
because I know this is happening, but I couldn't find a small enough uh, algorithm that I could make downloadable in this project. So I decided to make one. So I'm going to take you on my, my BMI prediction safari, my GitHub safari, as I like to call it, where I go to GitHub, search for a BMI in face, and just download everything that I can find, and then look what I've downloaded. And that's just a fascinating uh, thing to do, to, to stroll GitHub for all the weird stuff that's on there. But before I go into it, I'll have to talk a little bit about what body mass index is. So the body mass index is the ratio between your weight and your height. That's all it is. It's a ratio between those two things. And it's important to understand that BMI is not a universal thing. It's, it's something that you can't easily compare between people because there are a lot of factors that influence, uh, how you, yeah, that influence it. For example, uh, men and women have very different types of BMI that you can't just compare men and women, for example. But also culture is a factor, and uh, your sportiness is a factor. Um, to give an example, men have just wider faces. That's just a, a biological fact. Uh, but another example is with, with sports. This, these two people both have a really high BMI. But one is because he has a lot of body fat, and the other is because he has a lot of muscle mass. Right? But these, you can't just say these people have an equal BMI, so are equally healthy, for example. So BMI is complicated. At least that's the theory. But if you look at in practice what you find when you go to GitHub, you'll find um, a lot of projects that, that aren't taking this as, as seriously. Right? So you go to GitHub and you download this stuff, and this is some of the things you'll find. This is a, from a Chinese project. There's a lot of Chinese and Indian projects on there, interestingly. And here already you see that the entire complexity of BMI is just that we're going to put faces in, in three buckets, um, and those are just thin, fat, and normal. So all the complexity is just, no, we're going to make one universal algorithm and it labels you thin, fat, or normal. This is another Chinese one, which is slightly more complex, which will put you in buckets of fat, little fat, normal, thin, and very fat. But again, not very uh, nuanced there. So you might be wondering, how do you even measure someone's face? How does that work? Well, most of these projects use these seven ratios in your face. And it's a really quite interesting thing. Uh, they start by breaking down your face using a pretty standard uh, AI uh, library to get 68 points in your face. This is pretty much what it starts out with. It, it reduces your face to this. And then they create ratios some like, um, yeah, a lot of, like this, like cheekbone width divided by jaw width, etc. And I'll, it's easier if I just show you a little bit. So this, for example, is the width of your face in the middle of your face in relationship to the area of the bottom half of your face. So that's one of these ratios that are like, the, the ratio between those two is one of those factors. Another one, interestingly, is the ratio between the outside lines from your eyes and then the one in the middle. So this is something about how big the area above your eyes is, basically. And apparently, if you have a, if that's bigger, that must indicate that you uh, have a higher BMI. Another one is, is this one, which is uh, the bottom half of your face in relationship to the top of your face. But here you'll, you'll start to see something interesting, which is, remember this one? There's one thing missing, isn't there? There is no point in that for the top of your face. So what do these projects do to get a point for the top of your face? Well, they just extrapolate it by taking the, the points that they do have. So they take the points from the corner of your eyes, the middle of your eyebrows, and they draw a line through it, and whatever is the intersect, that's now going to be the top of your face. Of course, you already see the problem with this, which is that if you lower or raise your eyebrows, that has a tremendous effect on, on this, where this point is going to be calculated. And since you already know that two of these ratios are dependent on this point, like the one between this one and the, the eyebrows, um, raising or lowering your eyebrows has a lot of effects on the, the score you're going to get with a BMI prediction in this algorithm. So why these seven ratios in the first place? Who came up with this? Well, it was a psychologist called David Kutze who was researching whether or not you could predict BMI from your face in the first place. He was researching whether or not that's possible. Uh, and remember this one? This one's interesting because it's, this one is in all the algorithms that I found. They all use it. And this is what David Kutze has to say about this ratio. He says, the perimeter to area ratio did not correlate significantly with BMI in any of the data sets. So his own research says, don't use this one. It doesn't work. And yet they still all use it. Right? So my point here is that this stuff is not very scientific. 
uh, at all. It's just <laughs> the science is very dodgy. So another question you might have is to train an AI, you need data to train it on. Right? You need a lot of things. What do you need? You need, in this case, a lot of photos of people. And of those people, you need their, width, their weight and their height. If you have those things, you can weight and height, you can create a BMI score, and you have the face, and then you can create your algorithm. So where do you get that? Well, one of the most popular sources is celebrities. Celebrities have a lot of faces online. Um, and then all you need is their weight and their height. So where do you get that? Well, here it gets very interesting. They um, get their data sets from, from IMDB, the faces, and then they get the, the weights and heights from websites like howtallis.org. Which these types of websites are, as far as I can tell, just fan websites where people are guessing the weight and height of these people because it's totally unscientific, right? Because you need for these photos and these weights and heights to be, t you need the, the weight and height of this person on, on the photo to be measured at the same time as the photo was taken. Otherwise, you're just, you know, it's not good data. But with a website like this, you have no idea if the match, the photo, and the weight and height are any <laughs> any close to the real thing. So, the data is a total mess here. Interesting fact is that Christian Bale is very popular in these, uh, in these uh, research papers on how to uh, check whether or not your algorithm is in any way accurate. Because he played in some movies where he has a very thin face and where he has a very wide face. So if, he, if the algorithm kind of does an okay job there, that's a sign that your algorithm is okay. Another popular source of data is arrest records. So in the United States, you can be arrested and at that, you know, without even being found guilty, your photo will be uh, uploaded online, and these police officers will also measure your weight and your height, and that will also be made available. And I, I found out because I was looking through all this code, and I started finding these, these references to things like inmates in, in the code. I'm like, what's, what's going on here? And then I started looking a little bit closer, and I just realized that on my hard drive, I had not just code, but I had data sets of these photos that were apparently also just uploaded to GitHub, which was amazing. Uh, I've uh, taken one without a photo here, but this is kind of what this, this looks like, the police arrests uh, websites, where you can get all this data. And there's some very sensitive stuff in here as well, where it'll also tell you where someone was arrested, and, or where they were brought to, for, including like a mental health institution that will just be in that data. It's absolutely insane. So this is kind of what it looks like. I just had this, this huge amount of, of photos on my hard drive of arrested people. Another source that's popular is athletes. Because, again, you have websites full of athletes with their faces as well as their weight and height. So, another popular source. But, of course, as we saw earlier, people who are athletes have a very, not a normal BMI. So, it's not a great source to use. But, perhaps the most interesting one was this one. Maybe the most shocking is Reddit. So, I found a project that scraped Reddit's uh, Progress Picks community. Progress Picks is a community where people share their weight loss progress. So they show a before and after picture, and they always use the same format, so it's easy to scrape. Which is exactly what Google Research Health India did. So I got in contact with them, like, is, is this an official Google project? And um, they said, no, 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 it's not an official Google project. And someone I knew at Wired, and a journalist, also asked them the same question and got a completely different answer. <laughs> and a few, a, few, a few weeks later, the project was gone from GitHub completely, so uh, very interesting. But yeah, they created a scraper that just took progress pics from Reddit to train their algorithm. So I decided to make my own BMI prediction algorithm because, as I said, I couldn't find one that was um, small enough to use online. And what I basically want to talk to you is about all the design choices I had to make in that. Right? Because when we talk about AI, it can be easy to talk about as something uh, objective and neutral, but it totally isn't. It's just a, lot, a large string of design choices that I'm making. So the first one is, was I going to be nuanced about BMI? Was I going to take gender into account, for example, or culture, as I should? But no, I, I wasn't going to. I, I wanted to make an AI that was as bad as the one you would find in industry, because I wanted to show how bad it was. Uh, but yeah, again, the first choice I made was already to say, fuck it. Then the question became, what data should I use to train my AI? And I had all these photos on my hard drive now from all this downloading from GitHub, including uh, a huge number of Chinese celebrities and a lot of these arrest records. And I thought I could, I could work with those two. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is kind of what you get. You get these huge Excel sheets with those photos full of all the names of the photos as well as the BMI scores. Um, and 
Here, like I said, this is the one from the arrest records, and there in the top right, if you can see someone was, uh, me, uh, holding location was Cherokee Mental Health. So that's, I think, is a, a pretty uh, serious uh, data violation. Anyway, then the question becomes, in what way do I mix these, these photos? Like, what would that do to my, my algorithm? And that was really interesting to, to try this in different uh, ratios, to see what happens if I made my algorithm with more Chinese celebrities or with more arrest records. And it, it turned out this had a really big influence. Here you see my, my uh, training itself. Uh, it really had, this surprised me how big the influence was. If, if I put in more Chinese people, the outcomes of my AI were vastly different than if I used more arrest records. So this was really an important one. In the end, I, I decided to just go for 50-50. Um, I wanted to make, a, again, a universal uh, AI, so I thought I'd just mix it 50-50. I didn't really have a preference there. Um, Another question that I came to was, will I massage the data? So when you look at all the data points that I had, um, there were some people who, I'm hesitant to say, were, just had strange faces. You know, they, were, they were a little bit off in the data set. They were outliers that you will always get when you get a data set like this. And then I came to the same problem that a lot of people who make these AI systems have, which is, will I remove these um, the strange people or not? Do I remove the outliers? Because that has a big effect again on the AI. Um, because when they were in there, I got this lopsided graph where the majority of people's uh, faces would be measured less precisely because the algorithm was also taking account these very rare people. So here you see the original data, and this is what happens when I remove the outliers. You see that it becomes a lot more uh, precise for the majority at the cost of not having um, any data about the majority. Right? So these, these people are, are, are gone. Um, so what's the big picture? How well does this work? Well, here you see um, uh, the prediction error distribution um, uh, before and after I removed those uh, outliers. So what you see here is, is I know from all these photos what the score should be. And here you see how many points it was wrong from what it should be. So if, if it should be 14, a large group of people, the score was only two points off from what it should be. So that's, that's kind of good. Um, and then when I removed those outliers, you see the, at the bottom, it became even better. So most people, it was close to. But interestingly, when I had those outliers included, the maximum error that you could get is, is that you would 14 points of BMI score wrong. So there might have been someone with a score of 20 who got 34 somehow. But when I removed those outliers, the people who the system had never seen before, who were now also shown to it, the system just had no idea what to do with it. So it got outliers that well, it went all the way up to 20 BMI points difference. So here you see a trade-off that I'm making, that by removing those strange faces, those outliers, the effect is that it, the system works better for the majority of people, but I'm screwing over those people in the majority even more. Right, so those are very real uh, choices I'm making that, that very much relate to issues in society, right? About inclusion and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, you see it literally reflected in the AI. In general, you could say that with these algorithms, you have that for a large group of people, the algorithm is, is good and accurate. Then for a second tier, it's okay. And it goes all the way down until you have about uh, a third to 40% of people for which you could say the algorithm is not accurate at all or even very wrong. And this is kind of the, the graph that you have with every AI. Right? Every AI will work well for a certain group of people and screw over a small uh, group of other people. So as I said, this was about design choices that I made. Do I go for more gender-specific or do I go make a unisex one? Do I make it culture-specific? Do I make a universal one? Do I make it scientific or not? Etc. Um, and what you can say is these are basically trade-offs that I'm making. There is no way to make a perfect AI for this. I'm always making trade-offs where if I'm making it better for one group, I will make it worse for the other and vice versa. I cannot make a perfect face recognition AI in this case. That's a very important thing to understand, that these systems will never be perfect. There will always be trade-offs here uh, when you design this. Well, how well does it work? As we saw, it, it doesn't work very well, right? So as with a lot of these things in this, in this um, uh, documentary, you'll know that you, you'll feel like, oh my god, the system got me totally wrong. Well, well yeah, that's the point. It, these systems are used on you every day, and you don't even realize it. More, more importantly, they're often wrong, right? But they're, um, 
a right often enough to make it financially interesting for a lot of companies to use these. If your face recognition AI is right 60% of the time, that's already better than tossing a coin, so it's valuable. So why are these algorithms that are basically not working well so popular? Like, so as I said, one thing is, is the financial aspect, but I think another one that we don't really talk enough about is accountability. Right? One of the reasons you use an AI is to be able to say, I didn't make that judgment, the AI made that judgment. Right? It's a way to offload your responsibility or to evaporate your responsibility by being able to point to uh, something, code, and, and give it the blame which I think is, is a powerful uh, incentive for a lot of organizations to use AI. There's also a lot of things that I didn't put in this system, but that are being used, like uh, guessing whether or not you are gay based on your face is a thing. Uh, there are some companies who go even further, uh, claiming to predict whether or not you're a, a terrorist based on your face. Um, and of course, one that I could have literally put in here because I had the algorithm, but I didn't, was ethnicity. So you can find out, or try, you know, they claim to be able to find out someone's ethnicity based on your face. Um, but that's, again, often wrong. So what's my point with all this? Well, I hope to, to make clear that technology is definitely not neutral. Right? These AIs are not neutral. They are designed. Um, I make a lot of choices when I make it, and those choices are great trade-offs. It will never be a perfect algorithm. It will always make trade-offs and benefit some groups and, and harm others. So again, what this means is that technology is political, right? That's, of course, what you all understand, but uh, it is. Technology is, is about choices, and t choices are by definition political because it's something you can discuss together. Say, hey, why did you make that choice? Why did you use this data or that data, that methodology or that one? It's something we can discuss, and that means that we can hopefully hold it accountable. And uh, I hope that this talk can help us uh, yeah, understand that, uh, how this works, how the sausage is made in, in some of this stuff, and we can all keep this stuff accountable. Thank you very much. That was my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much. I learned a lot. It was super interesting. I'm glad you liked it. And if there are any people with questions, there are mics in the path in the middle. So if you want to know anything, I think, of course, they can approach you after if they come up with something smart. But um, if there are any questions now, go for it. Thank you for your interesting talk. You base your algorithm on face recognition. Would it help if you would extend your BMI prediction algorithm to the entire body, for example? That's a good question, yeah. I only found one project on GitHub that even tried that, interestingly enough. So uh, you would expect so, yeah. but. Um, again, I don't think, uh, even if you do that, that that will create a perfect BMI prediction algorithm, since that's just not possible. It'll still make mistakes. Um, so, but yeah, I think that's interesting why they, that's not... It seems as if they all just follow the same, uh, follow the leader. You know, like there's one algorithm that tries it and it uses these seven ratios. I think it was a Chinese project that did that. And then just everybody starts jumping on the bandwagon using the same technique and it just becomes the standard somehow. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is an initiative about banning facial recognition. What do you think about that? I'm a part of it. <laughs> uh, I created another project. If you like this one, there's another project I made um, uh, in a part of the Reclaim Your Face campaign that you're talking about, I think, um, which is a game where you can try to uh, not be recognized by the AI. And of course, why can't I think of the URL right now? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, uh, um, if you want, I can tell you later what the URL is. But yeah, I, I think we should ban face recognition technology in public space, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the consortium, the AI uh, consortium I was part of for the European Union, this was one of our recommendations. Actually, it was one of the recommendations that I had a big hand in, so yeah. Thank you. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, from a more political standpoint, um, are we to expect the European Union to put enough safeguards in place to kind of balance this out? I hope so. I mean, <laughs> I'm just an artist working <laughs> who works on the European Union research project, so I'm not the European Union. Um, but I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I live in the European Union, because <laughs> at least we're trying to do this stuff. True enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
Yeah, sorry if I missed this. I was sitting in Abacus waiting for the talk to start, so I, I missed most of it. Uh, I'd be interested in um, the validation of AI software. Do you, um, do you deal with that? Did you deal with that in your talk? Sorry, because I come from, from medical software and we were talking AI, you have to validate everything, make sure that there is no risk in this software. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Are there strategies? How would you do that? Well, I mean, basically my talk was uh, to show one strategy of doing that. Uh, by, going, by going to GitHub and just looking at what is out there, uh, looking at all these projects and seeing what people are doing, uh, basically that gives you a look under the hood of the car and see, oh, so this is how they're doing the BMI stuff mostly? Mm -hmm. This is what's normal? Uh, and then you just, you know, you're, you're just amazed at how, how much duct tape is involved. And uh, uh, yeah, so this is a way to audit that in the sense that I'm, I'm now telling you, don't trust these BMI prediction algorithms. They're just held together by duct tape, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I will definitely rewatch. Oh. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I basically have two questions. Um, first one. Uh, have you uh, planned any further extensions of this uh, AI? Uh, I think you can remember that. And the second question is, um, in what ways do you promote uh, new upcoming projects to use this AI, or wouldn't you promote it? So, oh, I would promote it. Um, oh, by the way, I, I just remember the name. So the, if you want more of this, you can go to ruu.eu which is the game where you can try to hide your face. And your first question was um, if, if I would extend the project. And um, that's a good question. I'm not going to extend this, because one of the issues with the project that I had looking back is that a lot of people still took um, the predictions my system made at face value. And the message that you cannot trust these systems that are very wonky didn't come across well often enough. So if I would do it another time, what I would do is something different, um, which is that I would let a number of different AIs judge your face at the same time. And then you can see that they will all create a different prediction. So for example, this beauty algorithm that was in this one is made in China, which means it will give a higher score to people who look Chinese. Right? For example, Johnny Depp is way more popular in China than George Clooney, because he has more Chinese-like features. Um, so, uh, but when you get it like a Chinese beauty algorithm, any Western one and an Indian one, then you will be able to see, hey, this really is cultured. I should ask the question, which AI is judging me at the moment? Who made it? Which culture was it trained on? Um, that matters a lot. So uh, if I would do it again, I would do that. I'd give you a, like a, a judge panel in a kind of a, a TV show kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next. OK, uh, I wanted to ask, what did you do technically? Like, how did you do the classifications? Was it a neural network or just some SVM or something? It was a, I used um, um, JavaScript, uh, Google's JavaScript tensor stuff. So I, it was as the, the thing you saw, the animation that was in the browser. So um, I used very basic, uh, uh, just uh, normal training of uh, is that answer your question, or you have? I, I'm not. I'm uh, so, not. So, so it was uh, <clears throat> fine-tuned on uh, fine-tuned on uh, fingerprints that you extracted, I guess. Yeah. And then just some single layers. And, yeah. Uh, so my algorithm took uh, extracted those 68 face points as well, then calculated all those face ratios, and then did the normal regression type thing and, and tried to find. Uh, yeah, it tried to do the same thing that I saw in the examples, basically, and then just. Uh, would spit out a prediction based on on, uh, on what it saw before, what it learned. Okay, it's, it's a very sim very simple one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I noticed uh, one of the data sets that uh, was used is uh, is celebrities. The celebrities quite often have uh, plastic surgery. Um, did you also come across a plastic surgery detection algorithm? No, I didn't. No, well, I mean, I didn't look for it either. So, ah, but that would be a good. That would be an interesting GitHub Safari to try for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of interesting things. And what I find so interesting about GitHub, for example, is that um, for Chinese, China has copies of their own platforms for a lot of things, right? They have their own WhatsApp. They have their own whatever. But China, Chinese programmers still use GitHub a lot. So it's a unique insight into what Chinese programmers think is is okay, and is in, so. In the, India and, and China are so highly represented in my data 
that is just unique, interesting to find out what they consider acceptable and, and ethical, which is, as you saw at the very first slides, they're not very precise about this stuff at all. It's, it's really um, uh, yeah, duct tape. And okay. I think that's interesting. one interesting thing about this is just the insight into Chinese uh, practices. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. I think we'll be rounding up the Q&A. I don't see any more questions, but if you come up with a question, I think they can uh, approach you of course. and ask anything. Well, thank you for the amazing talk. I think we all thoroughly enjoyed it, and another big applause.